uh, as we go. So I'd like to start by thanking thanking everybody for staying with us until until the end. And my special thanks go to uh, Dr. Olga Dragoy, who has kindly agreed to give a keynote presentation at this conference. And uh, I'd like to say a few words about about our our speaker. Uh, Olga, I think originally is a linguist or a uh, philologist in, in, in Russian terms uh, with a background in theoretical linguistics and later in, in clinical uh, linguistics, uh, having done uh, basic education, receiving a master degree at Potsdam, uh, followed by a PhD or a candidate degree. Uh, back back at home, uh, Dr. Dragoy on uh, Literature Horizon uh, was focused on uh, aphasia, aphasiology, and uh, specific deficits that aphasic um, people exhibit in uh, terms of syntax and, and, and other properties. But what's what strikes me first about uh, Olga is uh, genuine keen interest to different sides of the language function. And we discussed so many different things and thought of so many different projects. And you've moved to other areas, not just the physiology, but also other areas of connectivity. This is something we are going to hear more about today. And Olga is a very uh, successful, uh, so to speak, young senior scientist. Uh, we're heading a big and successful center for brain, for language and brain at uh, High School of Economics. And today uh, uh, she will speak to us about language pathways and white matter tracks in language processing. Thank you very much, Olga, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yuri, for such flattering introduction. I'm very happy that I finally managed to join you, uh, at least in this online uh, format. Um, I really hope that this year I would be able to come to St. Petersburg to meet all of you in person, but yeah, other forces um, interfered with my willings. Um, uh, I'm pleased and happy to uh, share with you today um, um, my thoughts and um, kind of summary about the contemporary um, state of language anatomical models, and uh, as well as to share with you uh, the recent findings coming from our own center. And um, as the title uh, states, I will talk today on uh, language white matter, of, about white matter pathways supporting uh, language as a higher cognitive function. And um, I would like to uh, start right away from uh, the focus of uh, my own view and the contemporary uh, common uh, view on language, uh, which is considered as a network-based function. Um, and of course, uh, I would like to mention the classic anatomy of language, and not to show that um, broken vernica dead, but uh, to probably revive the uh, forgotten notions, the classics in, uh, introduced. Uh, so the, uh, as most of you know, the classic anatomy of language includes uh, several uh, cen central notions, anatomical notions as the broken, the vertical areas, and the link, the anatomical connection between them, which is the acute fasciculus. And um, as the history goes, uh, um, in the most of these uh, findings uh, were uh, announced and published in um, uh, the uh, second half of the 19th century, although there is, some of you know that there is uh, some debate about the um, uh, Broca's area and the uh, debate between Paul Broca and uh, Mark Dux, who uh, stated that, uh, whose son stated that um, his father 
described the uh, Broca area and the, its major features 30 years before Paul Broca. But uh, Paul Broca is a renowned figure who, uh, whose name is in this area and uh, who is uh, always remembered in relations to the motive aspect of language. Uh, so um, with his name, um, the Pasteuria uh, third of the inferior frontal gyrus uh, is related to the, as the, is related to the seed of the ability to articulate language. And already at this point, I would like to make it very clear that uh, Paul Broca talked about articulation, not about syntactic abilities as we do uh, nowadays. So uh, literally, uh, he described uh, the uh, this type of aphasia, uh, which was further named with his name, uh, as uh, the loss uh, not of uh, not the, of the memory of the words, nor the action of the nerves, meaning that the deficit is neither uh, the core linguistic, for example, syntactic, uh, nor peripher peripheral. Um, it is a particular faculty to articulate language, which is lost, he said. Um, so no articulation was possible in uh, his uh, famous patients. Um, so uh, a decade later, uh, Carl Wernicke uh, described the posterior part of this superior temporal gyrus as the seat of auditory word images. And he was uh, his probably uh, the second uh, important contribution to the language model at that time was that he uh, clearly described the link, the anatomical white matter link between the Wernicke and the Broca area, which is the acute fasciculus. And um, a little bit later, Ludwig Lichtheim uh, summarized uh, these findings and uh, um, clearly articulated a revolutionary at that time integral model of neuroanatomical pathways supporting language, communication, and, uh, and uh, as communication among brain regions. And uh, that was very important because that was uh, basically the first language related clear articulation of functional specialization. Um, uh, and um, later on, uh, this, this model is known as uh, in different versions as Broca-Vernicke-Lidheim uh, or Broca-Vernicke-Lidheim-Geschwind model. Um, Geschwind joined this company a little bit later, a century later, in fact. and. Um, uh, summarize it again, uh, put new life into the model, uh, made it uh, very wide known and common, uh, but simplified it. And a lot of very important uh, nodes uh, of classics uh, were forgotten at this point. So um, the classic anatomy of language, as Geschwind described it in 1979 um, was characterized by limited special precision. So the uh, even Broca and Wernicke areas were described uh, not very clearly, uh, but the model also was characterized by high functional modularity. So it was clearly stated that um, only those uh, specifically mentioned areas uh, are relevant for language and the link between them. Uh, this model, this uh, form of model, uh, suffers from a few uh, very uh, important drawbacks. First of all, it doesn't account at all for language complexity. As the linguists who are present here, and also the psychologists and other. Um, uh, people from other specialities who deal with language, of course, know that language is a multi-layer phenomenon. Uh, so this model took language as language in general. It didn't differentiate between layers of language, 
that is phonologic, lexical, syntactic discourse, very important layer. This is the way how we actually communicate. And um, uh, the findings uh, of uh, the, from the recent decades uh, clearly indicate that broken vernic aphasias uh, do not occur necessarily after the damage to those lesions. This is greatly summarized in the paper by Nina Drunkers in 2007. Um, so basically, if a patient gets a stroke into a, it's her broker area, uh, it, she may get or not the broker aphasia. And on the other hand, another patient with a damage outside broker area can get the broker aphasia. Um, and at this point, I would like to get back to original writings, uh, the classics. Um, for example, uh, Ludwig Liedheim wrote, oops, can you hear me? Yes, everything works. Can you hear me well? Yes, pretty well. Well, can anybody respond to me? Yes, we can hear you well. Anna, tell me if you can hear me. I can hear you, yes. Great, because my uh, earphone connection was lost for some reason. Okay. We can hear you well. Okay, great. So go on. So Ludwig Lichheim wrote, uh, I do not consider the function to be localized in one spot of the brain. Seems very familiar to us now, but rather to result from the combined action of the whole sensorial sphere. So um, the classics who uh, proposed this model already stated that it is not modular. Um, on the other hand, Wernicke wrote that everything which goes beyond elementary physical functions is an achievement of the fiber tracts, which connect the different regions of the cortex to each other. So this is um, one of the first and very clear indications about the role of white matter tracts in the language system. So it's uh, the uh, model of language shouldn't be uh, limited to cortical regions only. Um, and uh, here we uh, switch to uh, the modern state of the art. Uh, and the, uh, there are different contemporary models of language. And um, uh, there is uh, one, uh, I would say a family of models, uh, which is summarized in this sl slide. Um, uh, it is inspired by uh, models of visual processing and is referred as dual stream uh, model of language. So similarly to, visual processing. Uh, in this model, uh, uh, the uh, what stream and the how stream are stated. And uh, the, uh, in, in the visual uh, domain, the what stream uh, supports feature and object recognition and the how stream supports spatial localization for movement coordination. And um, uh, this uh, metaphor and this philosophy is brought to the language domain and uh, the dorsal stream, which is here in red, um, is stated to support uh, sensory motor integration and um, is stated to be involved and uh, supporting language production, first of all. And the ventral stream, um, which is here in blue, uh, uh, is proposed uh, to support speech comprehension. And um, yeah, there, were, there is a number of papers uh, um, describing this model. So uh, this is um, a more detailed scheme of the dual stream model uh, of language. And uh, you can see here the dorsal stream uh, connecting the uh, inferior parietal areas and the, the posterior temporal areas with uh, the uh, posterior frontal regions both inferior and superior. And uh, the, do the do dorsal stream is considered to be more uh, lateralized in the language dominant hemisphere, which is left in most of people. And the ventral stream um, is more bilaterally uh, organized and um, 
includes uh, um, acoustic processing, uh, sorry, uh, phonological processing, lexical retrieval, and uh, semantic processing. And um, uh, the ventral stream uh, is all also stated to be connected ventrally uh, to the uh, posterior inferior frontal gyrus. And um, yes, this is what I mentioned. So uh, in the ventral stream, um, uh, the authors included the following processing stages. So the superior temporal gyrus supports phonological processing, so acoustic and phonology, and the middle temporal gyrus and actually inferior uh, temporal gyrus supports lexical access, and the temporal pole is responsible for integration of semantic information. And you can see that this is, uh, these stages uh, clearly uh, reflect the uh, comprehension aspect of language. So we hear some acoustic sig signal, we access words, we process semantics. And the, dor the dor dorsal stream, which is more left hemisphere, lateralized, includes uh, sensory motor integration. And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit in details further, um, uh, which uh, basically uh, takes place in the angular gyrus. And then the information goes to the inferior frontal gyrus, the insular cortex, which is hidden here in between the uh, frontal and temporal lobes and uh, premotor cortex and uh, so which supports articulation for language. Right. And um, just to mention that uh, both pathways are stated to interact with the distributed semantic network. I won't go in details uh, regarding this, but it, um, it is related to uh, the uh, notion of distributed semantics. Uh, which is uh, which basically uh, is linked to our sensory motor um, behavior and experience. Uh, there are different. There is basically um, vast uh, evidence in favor of uh, this dual stream philosophy and dual stream model of language. And just to mention, uh, uh, there is a, a recent meta-analysis of. Uh, 11,000 fMRI experiments and where the authors um, uh, show uh, language specific components uh, for the uh, audition auditory purely auditory task and you can see here uh, that this task highlights and causes the activation uh, in the uh, primarily in the temporal um, cortex bilaterally clearly bilaterally and equally bilaterally um, speech production uh, 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 induces activation in the uh, uh, superior temporal gyrus and um, uh, posterior uh, frontal lobe, uh, both in, uh, inferiorly and more superiorly. And it is bilateral, but we can see more activation in the left hemisphere. And uh, the comprehension, uh, which is uh, a complex, actually, language comprehension is a little bit more complex uh, in terms of linguistic components than just audition, uh, because it entails uh, both listening, uh, lexical access, comprehension of syntactic constructions, and uh, also um, activates some uh, frontal areas uh, for because of syntactic processing, uh, because of sensor motor integration and yeah, different kinds of motor stereotypes that can be induced uh, by this, the semantics of what we comprehend. Um, so, um, but uh, the uh, dual stream, uh, the family of dual stream models of language uh, are not uh, specific at all uh, in terms of actual, uh, actual anatomical pathways uh, conveying this information and uh, supporting the interaction between these cortical regions, which are in the model. And, uh, but other people thought about that. Um, and here we go to uh, the associative white matter tracts um, uh, of the brain, uh, which uh, are um, 
uh, just one category of uh, white matter pathways uh, existing in the brain. Uh, they connect cortical areas and also subcortical uh, uh, gray matter nuclei within one hemisphere. Uh, so, which means, but we do not include corpus callosum here, for example. They provide long distance associations, uh, meaning that uh, they connect different lobes primarily. Of course, every uh, gyro, every gyrus uh, is uh, connected to the next one, and these are so-called U-shaped fibers. They are not associated with white matter tracts. And um, this, uh, this kind of white matter tracts are now uh, considered as central elements uh, in contemporary models of different, in fact, high cortical functions, including language. And this is what we're going to discuss today. So um, getting closer to language pathways, which you basically saw in this slide. Um, so what I'm going to um, overview today is the acute fasciculus, which is already familiar to you, uh, providing sensory motor integration and in particular phonological processing. It is here in red with its uh, three segments. Uh, the frontal Aslan tract, which is here in purple, supporting speech initiative and spontaneity. The inferior frontal occipital tract in purple, uh, supporting semantic processing. And uh, another system of uh, ventral associative white matter tracts, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus in orange, uh, which is more involved in lexical interface and the onsen fasciculus, which is um, uh, which function uh, is still difficult to tell for the moment, but it is believed to be involved uh, to some aspects of semantic processing. So the acute fasciculus, and you can see already here that it's multicolored. And here is um, how we depict it. This is a convention. So um, historically, as I mentioned already, the uh, acute fasciculus is a central language pathway. Um, and uh, it has um, three uh, uh, major uh, areas of termination, which, is, uh, which are uh, the posterior inferior frontal uh, cortex, the inferior parietal cortex, and the posterior superior temporal cortex. Please pay attention that that's already much more than just broken Wernicke areas. In particular, you can see here that uh, two segments of the acute fasciculus uh, considerably terminate in the so-called Geschwind area which is in superior uh, temporal, inferior parietal. Um, and um, as I already introduced, uh, one of the uh, uh, commonly accepted model uh, states that uh, the acute fasciculus has three major segments, the long, the direct segment, which is here in red, and you can see it here. Uh, and um, with the terminations in the uh, posterior primarily inferior frontal gyrus, but also uh, some authors uh, state that it terminates in the posterior middle temporal gyrus. And um, the temporal terminations include uh, primarily uh, posterior middle and inferior temporal gyrus. And again, please pay attention that this is not the classic Wernicke area. The Wernicke area is here in the superior temporal gyrus. And in, uh, in my lab, we do a lot of uh, tractography reconstructions, and we very rarely we see uh, the terminations of the acute fasciculus in the superior uh, temporal gyrus. And um, in the, mo the model also includes uh, two other short indirect segments of the acute fasciculus. The anterior one, which is here in green, um, connecting the like the broker territory, the uh, posterior inferior frontal gyrus, and the Geschwind area, which I uh, already mentioned. And 
the second uh, indirect segment is the posterior one, connecting uh, the same area where the uh, long uh, segment terminates and the uh, posterior part of the Geshwin territory. And here, how they come together. Mm, uh, already here, I would like to mention that uh, this anatomy of the uh, most uh, studied uh, language pathway, the acute fasciculus, uh, is still an open question. Uh, we have questions about both prefrontal, about frontal and temporal terminations of the acute fasciculus. For example, um, for um, a decade, um, tractography was done uh, with the so-called uh, DTI diffusion tense uh, reconstructions. And it has uh, some drawbacks. And now we switch to more advanced uh, modeling of tractography. For example, here I present the spherical uh, constrained spherical deconvolution model of uh, uh, the same uh, long segment uh, of the acute fasciculus. And this is the same subject. And this is the same uh, data acquired in the same scanner. Just we use two different approaches to tractography to reconstruct this long segment, which results in quite different reconstructions, as you can see. So uh, there was a question, uh, an open question about uh, the existence of this prefrontal, which you can see, uh, as you can see, really go terminations of the acute fasciculus, which really go to the uh, orbital cortex. Uh, and also there are questions about the temporal terminations of the acute fasciculus. For example, here you can see the, um, uh, that was 10 years ago already, and still we do not know where exactly it terminates. Uh, so here is the probability of um, uh, temporal terminations of the AF. Uh, as you can see, it can terminate very close to the, even to the temporal pole. Um, and um, to find out, in, in, a t in an attempt to find out uh, the real anatomy of uh, the acute fasciculus, uh, we go for ex vivo dissections. And um, uh, actually, already nearly a century ago, uh, the, the, the famous dissector Klinger uh, showed, and this is just a picture from his book, 1935, uh, showed how far to the prefrontal cortex the acute fasciculus goes. And here you can see um, the modern uh, dissection from uh, my Argentinian friend neurosurgeon. Um, here's the acute fasciculus with his uh, several uh, terminations in the premotor cortex, in the inferior frontal cortex, and also with prefrontal termination. So you can see that the, the anatomy is much more uh, than um, the than we still consider, and uh, I would like also to uh, uh, mention that uh, in my lab we do uh, this kind of dissections, and uh, we try to contribute to the anatomy of the acute fasciculus. And here how it goes. So basically, we um, uh, do manual dissections and then scan it, um, and then our uh, in an effort to make uh, a three D three D um, uh, anatomy atlas in the end. So here, this is my own reconstruction. And here's the acute, this is the Geshwin territory. You can see the anterior segment coming here, the posterior, the long segment is below, and it extends to the prefrontal regions as well. Yeah, you need some experience to see that. <laughs> so um, a few words about the development of the acute fasciculus. Uh, and it is uh, closely related to the language development, as you will see, uh, as you see in this slide. So in newborns, um, uh, only the pathway connecting the temporal uh, regions, here's the newborn, um, the temporal region with the premotor, not the broker area, not the inferior frontal gyrus yet, uh, just premotor areas. Um, uh, so only this pathway is myelinated uh, when you are born. And this is related to the uh, Babylon period. 
and um, uh, the known early learning of rule-based dependencies from auditory input. So I would say that uh, this uh, um, part of the acute fasciculus uh, is the uh, obligatory substrate, uh, which is uh, necessary for uh, early language development, which is sensory mode integration in essence. So you hear something, you try to repeat, right? And you uh, uh, derive uh, auditory rules from your auditory input. And um, so uh, and they can, the uh, blue connection, with, which you can see here, and which is present in adults, is not even fully myelinated uh, by seven years old. It is there already, but it's not fully developed. And um, so um, there is... Um, there are two uh, sources of evidence uh, suggesting that uh, this blue part uh, of the acute fasciculus is uh, constitutes and supports the uh, fully fledged language uh, uh, which we practice now, for example. Um, on one hand, uh, it is shown that adults accurately process syntactically complex sentences and activate this part the broca area and the posterior portion of the superior temporal gyrus and sulcus uh, during uh, this uh, syntactic processing. And on the other hand, children under the age of seven do not process always correctly uh, complex sentences. And this part of the acute fasciculus, as I mentioned, is not uh, fully myel myelinated yet. Uh, right. Um, there is um, an interesting aspect of the acute fasciculus, which is its lateralization. Um, so we'll uh, talk now, we'll focus now on the long segment of the acute fasciculus. So there is uh, the overall uh, prevalence of uh, a symmetric distribution uh, of the direct segment of the AF. So it's um, uh, in most people, it's strongly left lateralized. And this is uh, the seminal paper by Marco Catani, uh, who uh, was the first uh, showing um, what kind of distribution uh, there is uh, in uh, a human population regarding lateralization of the long segment of the acute. So 62 and a half. Uh, percent of uh, his group had um, the long segment of the acute fasciculus only in the left hemisphere. Now we know, that 13 years later, that uh, this result is uh, partially uh, a drawback of the um, uh, DTI reconstructions they used at that time. So uh, now when we do, uh, in my lab, we've done like hundreds of reconstructions. Uh, and uh, it is very rare when we do not see uh, the uh, right um, uh, long segment of the acute fasciculus, even in um, clinical population. Um, so this picture basically means that uh, there is strong left lateralization in most of the people, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is nothing here in the long segment on the right. It just means that it's very thin and some um, uh, tractography model doesn't allow to reconstruct it. So then uh, there are two nearly equal groups uh, with uh, the uh, bilateral but uh, still left lateralized long segment and a symmetrical bilateral representation of it. Um, and um, this study was done in um, uh, 40 right-handed individuals. Uh, later on, uh, the, this basically the same result uh, was uh, uh, was got and uh, people with both uh, right-handed uh, preference and uh, with atypical handedness, uh, ambidextrous or left-handed. And you can see here that it, it constitutes. This is the uh, absolute numbers. So, but basically, this is. Uh, 81% of right-handed and the same number of people with atypical handedness still have uh, strong uh, left lateralization of the long segment of the acute. And um, 
uh, importantly, it has been shown that uh, there is uh, a significant correlation uh, of uh, the lateralization of the acute fasciculus, the long segment, with language performance. Uh, for example, the, the same study showed that um, higher left lateralization of the acute fasciculus correlates with better vocabulary and complex ideation performance, complex ideation. Is, uh, is um, a subtest of uh, a diagnostic test. This is basically a comprehension of uh, complex sentences. In atypical handed people, and it is correlated with better semantic fluency uh, in right handed people. So uh, um, uh, this cohort is healthy people, but still uh, language performance is variable in healthy people. Uh, as well as in the clinical population, uh, not that drastically, but still. Um, and um, uh, the lateralization of the acute fasciculus predicts uh, the uh, language performance. Um, the clinical data uh, sheds uh, some more light on uh, functional specificity of the acute fasciculus. Uh, uh, so the story started with uh, uh, the acknowledgement of a general contribution of the acute fasciculus for language, like again, language in general, to different aspects of language. Uh, for example, um, in this study, uh, it has been shown that uh, it is the acute fasciculus lesion load. These are stroke patients. Um, the acute fasciculus lesion load size significantly predicts rate informativeness and overall efficiency of speech, as well as naming abilities. So all kinds of language aspect measures in this study. Uh, you can see it clearly here. So this is the AF lesion load. So 100% means 100 of acute fasciculus, uh, acute fasciculus uh, lesion. And here you can see the words per minute and um, uh, information units uh, per minute, produced per minute. Um, and uh, uh, both uh, uh, metrics are reduced the more uh, the uh, larger acute fasciculus uh, is lesioned. Um, on the other hand, um, there's going more to the specificity of the acute fasciculus. It has been shown that uh, it is um, the AF focal lesions, so lesions exactly to the acute fasciculus, in, uh, correlate with selective difficulties in repeating heard words, but uh, do not correlate uh, with word comprehension, picture naming, and verbal fluency. Uh, and uh, this uh, behavioral linguistic pattern is representative for the conduction of aphasia. And here you can see uh, where exactly the uh, um, lesion was in this cohort of uh, patients. Um, and uh, uh, in the same vein, uh, in this study, uh, they showed that damage to the acute fasciculus uh, co specifically causes uh, impairment at the phonological level in different tasks. But as soon as phonology was involved, uh, the language performance was reduced. So um, uh, this data highlights the importance of the acute fasciculus for the uh, non-semantic integration of auditory and motor speech processing, which constitutes the sensor motor integration, which I have already mentioned. Uh, Similar uh, support and similar data comes from intraoperative uh, language mapping with direct electrical stimulation. And in this study, in this recent study um, uh, um, by Johanna Serpovska, our close colleague, um, it has been beautifully shown uh, that uh, the non-word repetition task is very sensitive, is, basically the, the most sensitive task for during the acute fasciculus stimulation. It was compared uh, with the word repetition task and the, with picture naming. And you can see here what uh, went on during the operation when the neurosurgeon stimulated the acute fasciculus and the linguistic tested a patient with 
the non-word repetition task with the word repetition task and with picture naming. Um, so here in black, you can see that this task uh, was related to the um, uh, most numerous errors. And um, at the post-operative stage, uh, the non the non word repetition was uh, uh, heavily impaired and was more impaired than other aspects of language. And here you can see in two patients, for example, uh, in which the uh, non word repetition task uh, didn't work well. And uh, in uh, picture naming, uh, the uh, phonological paraphrases were induced, which is like another side of uh, phonological processing in production. Uh, these uh, two patients got a uh, severe deficit in non-word repetition after the operation. Uh, so um, in addition to uh, the same idea that uh, the acute fasciculus supports uh, sensor motor integration and phonological processing in particular, uh, this study uh, suggests strongly suggests that non-word repetition is exactly the task that should be used for intraoperative uh, acute fasciculus mapping. Uh, what about the right acute fasciculus? Do we need it at all? We do. Uh, that's the current answer. Um, there is a very, very interesting study uh, uh, published six years ago uh, about uh, the uh, role of the right uh, long segment of the acute fasciculus uh, in uh, post-stroke um, aphasia severity. Uh, you can see here in the graph um, the volume of the uh, long segment of the right acute fasciculus and the aphasia quotidian reflecting uh, the overall aphasia severity. severity. Uh, in this cohort of patient. So uh, the more uh, the volume of the, acute the right acute fasciculus is, the less severe aphasia is. And here you can see um, three uh, representative patients with uh, very uh, non-representative, uh, sorry, um, acute fasciculus in the right hemisphere, and, and which is here, on the aphasia quotidian scale, uh, this patient has larger acute fasciculus and it, uh, behaves much better. And this patient with the very thick arc long segment of the AF in the right hemisphere had no aphasia at all. So this data highlights functional re relevance of the right acute fasciculus either for um, uh, language uh, in general, because we don't know uh, if this is the result of the reorganization um, or stroke reorganization uh, or the initial uh, state of the uh, pathways in this particular individual, or it might reflect uh, the genuine post-stroke reorganization. Okay. Hmm. So the next um, uh, white matter pathway, which is important for language and uh, which is uh, a focus of my own research is the frontal Aslan tract. Um, so this is the uh, uh, long ranged uh, tract uh, uh, present in the frontal lobe. So it doesn't connect different lobes. It connects distant regions within the frontal lobe. And it has terminations in the uh, posterior inferior frontal gyrus and uh, uh, inferiorly and uh, supplement remoter area or pre-supplement remoter area superiorly in the superior frontal gyrus. It is uh, uh, identified both in post-mortem dissections and uh, with uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Um, so there is no question that it exists. Uh, it is bilateral and uh, some authors state, like Marco Catani eight years ago stated that it has left hemisphere dominance, but this is still an open question. We don't see in our data that it, uh, it is lateralized. It's still a debate going on. Um, so thinking about the uh, function of the frontal Aslan tract, uh, 
we should get back to the uh, to its anatomy because the anatomy itself suggests uh, the fun its functional contribution. So it connects the SMA supplementary motor area, which is widely known um, for uh, behavioral su uh, supporting behavioral planning and executive control. With posterior inferior frontal gyrus, I don't have to mention its role in language production. So the fat, the, the frontal Aslan tract, is a direct connection between them. So one might think, and in fact, people thought that, uh, that a frontal Aslan tract is a path allowing communication between general initiative and control, executive control, and language. And in fact, uh, this idea was uh, supported by some clinical data. For example, the uh, fat damage correlated with a reduced verbal fluency in uh, uh, patients uh, with brain damage of different uh, etiology in stroke, tumor, and primary progressive aphasia patients. And, um, uh, but um, there was no, uh, before we did that, in, in the end, uh, there was no uh, the direct evidence for the causal role of the frontal Aslan tract uh, for this aspect of language. The intraoperative direct electrical stimulation studies uh, showed uh, non-specific uh, contribution of the frontal Aslan tract for language. Uh, for example, in these studies, uh, the, the authors mostly used object naming and got different kinds of like non-specific, not very revealing um, uh, language errors like speech arrest, delayed speech, perseverations, all variety of language errors one can get during electrical stimulation of the brain. So um, in sum, uh, the, the, the previous studies showed, confirmed a language relevance of the left fat but uh, didn't show its functional specific specificity for speech initiation, spontaneity, and fluency, as it was predicted uh, theoretically. So we decided to test that carefully and uh, thought that um, sentence completion could be a very good task to tap into the function of the frontal Aslan tract uh, for the following reasons. Uh, so when you comprehend uh, the beginning of the sentence, the context, uh, and have to complete the sentence with a word or two, um, you do active syntactic sequences and context-relevant lexical search. And this is like a true initiation of uh, real propositional language. It is not the fully-fledged language as I do now, but kind of uh, a spontaneous language in miniature. Um, and uh, from um, uh, a physiology, we know that it is exactly the inability to build a complete sentence, uh, which is a core symptom of the so-called dynamic aphasia related to the frontal lobe uh, damage. Um, so we contrasted uh, the uh, sentence completion task with the, the uh, action naming. Uh, picture naming uh, with depicted actions. And we had uh, 12 neurosurgery cases with uh, the pathology adjacent to the frontal Aslan tract, which, which we checked uh, on their individual tractography reconstructions. Uh, so the tasks were the following for the action naming, like the standard uh, linguistic interoperative task, uh, a patient had to uh, say here what the hero uh, what the hero is doing in a picture here sings this payot in Russian in one word and uh, um, in the sentence completion task uh, a patient had to read aloud uh, the two words presented in the screen and complete with one word Svinka жует траву for example um, and for those of you who are not aware uh, with the um, uh, interoperative um, functional mapping procedure. This is a brief overview. So we're usually following the uh, 3A uh, procedure, a sleep awake asleep. Uh, when first uh, for the access, uh, the patient is uh, completely sedated. Um, and then uh, 
uh, she is awakened and we do uh, the neurosurgeon does uh, elect direct electrical stimulation, usually with a bipolar stimulator, and uh, a linguist uh, does functional uh, testing, linguistic testing. And uh, every time the stimulation co-occurs with a linguistic error, uh, we mark uh, this piece of the brain with um, a marker, uh, and then the neurosurgeon tries to uh, not to resect it. That's not our business anymore. Uh, so this is how uh, uh, we uh, uh, considered the awake uh, setup in theory before we did that. This is how it is in real life. And um, coming back to our study of the frontal Aslan tract, uh, here you can see the uh, mapping results of our 12 patients. And um, here are those markers I mentioned. And uh, so uh, based on intraoperative photography or uh, navigation, uh, we identified those sites on MRI, preoperative MRI of uh, individual patients. Um, and um, we found that in most uh, positive sites, uh, when a patient uh, made errors in the linguistic task, there was a task dissociation so a patient could name an action based on a picture, but couldn't complete the presented sentence, could read the beginning of the word of the sentence, but couldn't come up with the final word. And um, here you can see the distribution of the positive sides uh, for uh, both tasks. So the green sides are those specifically responsive for sentence completion here. And the, the uh, blue sides, which are quite rare, are specifically responses for, responsive for uh, verb generation, action picture naming, and the, uh, the orange sides uh, were those where the patient couldn't do both tasks. Uh, since we had uh, preoperative tractography for all of the patients, we overlaid the found uh, positive sides on tractography reconstructions. And here what we found. All these sites um, specifically responsive for sentence completion were exactly on in, were in very close vicinity to the um, frontal Aslan tract. And you can see here, the frontal Aslan tract is in purple. You can see uh, the variability of its anatomy in each individual patient. Of course, this is driven by pathology because these are mostly uh, tumor patients and the tumor can shift uh, the uh, tract to whatever side, to, to the front or to the back. At um, the front lesson tract with the classic anatomy um, uh, between the IFG and the SMA, pre-SMA, uh, may end up in the motor cortex or in the, uh, very frontally in the prefrontal cortex. But every time uh, the positive sites, specifically responsive for sentence completion, were exactly on the frontal Aslan tract. And uh, um, the uh, second interesting finding uh, um, in this study was what uh, happened with this patient after the operation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, we just identified the positive linguistic positive sites, and then this is a medical business whether to resect it or not. And anyway, all those operations were uh, done very close to the uh, white matter tracts, and um, in some cases it was traumatized. Um, so uh, some patients, uh, namely half of them, got um, uh, got some uh, uh, deterioration um, of the of some aspects of language, and when they got it, it, that was every time the discourse level, the level of spontaneous speech, and uh, most of the patients recovered. Uh, three, six months uh, after the operation. And this uh, raises a, another very interesting question about uh, functional reorganization. So if we destroy or um, um, somehow damage 
partially the left frontal Aslan tract, still most of the patients recover. So what happens? Uh, does the right frontal Aslan tract uh, take over uh, or there, there are some other uh, processes going on uh, ipsilaterally? We still don't know. Um, right. So um, for the sake, sake of the time, I will uh, move further to um, the ventral uh, language pathways, which are um, inferior frontal occipital fasciculus here, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the ansonate. And um, some years back, uh, the, uh, the, the, actually the uh, father of the, still living father of uh, awake craniotomies, the um, uh, French neurosurgeon uh, Hugh Dufour proposed that uh, these three tracts uh, constitute um, uh, two semantic pathways for language, the direct with the uh, inferior frontal occipital and the indirect, because there is a switch here in the temporal pole with the inferior longitudinal and the anson fasciculus. So, let's consider their specific functions. So the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus uh, connects uh, the occipital cortex uh, and the uh, frontal or the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, it is as all basically all associative tracts. It is represented bilaterally and um, mm, as far as I know, uh, there is no uh, statement uh, at the moment that it is left or right lateralized. And the electrical stimulation during uh, awake craniotomies induces uh, semantic paraphasias, meaning that instead of one word like cat, uh, a patient produces uh, another word, either semantically related or closely semantically related or distantly. So it ca can be dog or, I don't know, so far. Uh, uh, and um, it's damage uh, due to a stroke or uh, neurosurgical resection leads to the impairment of semantic processing. And it is expressed both in comprehension and production. So this is why this pathway is proposed as the uh, semantic pathway for language in general. Uh, the uh, indirect semantic pathway uh, proposed by Hugh Dufour includes uh, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the ascent fasciculus. And uh, uh, the ILF has basically the same terminations in the occipital pole as the IFOF. Um, and, um, it goes to the temporal pole, uh, to the place uh, from where the ansonate fasciculus originates. So this, the temporal pole is considered as um, a switch point between the ILF and the ansonate fasciculus. Um, both tracts uh, um, are represented bilaterally too, as the IFOF, although for the ILF, there is uh, an open debate uh, whether it's uh, still left lateralized uh, or right lateralized. And you can see uh, these two different opinions in the, these two papers mentioned. And the electrical stimulation of uh, the uh, ILF and the uh, ansen fasciculus induce anomias, and, um, which is uh, considered as rooted in the dissociation between uh, the visual image and semantics picture-based and a word to be retrieved. And also uh, the stimulation of ILF causes reading problems. We'll get back to that in the next slide. And uh, damage of uh, primarily the um, ILF leads to difficulties in lexical semantic processing, both in comprehension and production. So it's not related to specific language modality. So uh, among uh, uh, these uh, ventral uh, language pathways, uh, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus is uh, uh, the, the most widely uh, studied. Uh, until recently, uh, its function were inferred by pure anatomical reasoning. So it connects the temporal pole with the occipital regions and 
they both are known to contribute to object recognition and that the symptoms uh, observed uh, when the ILF was damaged uh, were visual agnosia, prosopagnosia, and alexia, so visually re vision related problems. So uh, it, the functions of ILF were related primarily to the visual processing. And recently, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it was shown to be uh, largely involved in semantic and lexical processing. This is why now it is uh, considered as the pathway uh, conveying lexical semantic interface. So <clears throat> uh, there is uh, some evidence supporting that uh, it, it is involved in semantic processing and lexical semantic processing in particular. So um, again, thinking about the anatomy, <coughs> the ILF provides uh, the link to the anterior, anterior temporal lobe, the, the temporal pole, which is commonly accepted now in uh, neurolinguistic as a transmodal semantic hub. So uh, in patients with uh, semantic dementia and uh, semantic version of the primary progressive aphasia, uh, in which uh, the ILF is disrupted, um, we see a semantic impairments. And then in healthy populations, population, it has been shown that my microstructural properties of both ILF and the, acute, the, the ancient fasciculus are predictive of successful noble word learning. And also the properties of the ILF uh, were correlated with the richness of semantic autobiographical memory. Uh, these uh, pieces of evidence are taken as supporting the semantic function of the ILF and um, the lexical retrieval um, uh, function uh, of ILF uh, is supported by uh, post-surgical uh, uh, data. Uh, that is, um, after the surgery, the uh, residual tumor infiltration in the left ILF was found to be a strong predictor of uh, stable permanent impairments in naming. And uh, in stroke patients, on the other hand, disruption of the left ILF was predictive of naming impairments for certain non-unique categories. And for those who are familiar with um, physiology literature, this is exactly those um, uh, non-unique category deficits when uh, a patient cannot uh, name animals or fruits or some other entities of, from some other uh, spe very specific semantic category. So this is related to the ILF damage nowadays. Um, the answer of fasciculus um, is um, the, the least uh, uh, understood uh, language pathway for the moment. Um, the neurosurgery society uh, is confident that uh, they can uh, safely remove the ancient fasciculus and it won't cause any uh, behavioral consequences to a patient. Uh, but um, neurolinguists found out that this removal causes the impairment of naming of famous faces and objects. And this is uh, exactly why uh, famous faces naming is um, uh, a very, um, uh, sensitive task for interoperative mapping of the ancient fasciculus. So we basically present uh, pictures, photos of famous people and uh, ask to name them. But uh, since uh, the ancient fasciculus is intimately anatomically related to the limbic system, it is not clear whether it's, we're talking about language, pure, purely linguistic function, or about uh, emotional component uh, involved in this kind of tasks. Um, so this all brings us uh, to um, like a new model of language, uh, which some call hodological mode of, of language uh, derived from the Greek word hodos, meaning path. So that's the model of uh, language pathways and the critical role of them uh, in the language processing. Um, I would say that these are uh, main postulate of this family of models. Um, 
and uh, the first of which uh, is that functions of specific pathways are based should be based in the quality of the transferred and interacting information. A great example of this is the frontal Aslan tract, as I showed you. So it uh, it is the tract uh, functionally uh, connecting the language system and the uh, executive control system. And so the function should be derived um, as um, providing uh, this kind of interaction between executive control and language. Um, then uh, most of the tracts have bilateral representation and it is an open question of what it means for language reorganization due to brain damage. Uh, we know that some dorsal tract uh, uh, are more left lateralized, but still most of uh, the associative uh, language related pathways are not. And which is the most important uh, is a, a recent uh, finding that uh, in contrast to cortical areas, um, white matter tracts are characterized by reduced plasticity. That gives, um, uh, that uh, this is the basis for the notion of the minimal, the so-called minimal common brain, uh, which includes uh, white matter tracts as the core um, anatomical system supporting language, um, which can uh, change a little bit and uh, make uh, the cortical representations of language shift. But if these core elements, white matter tracts are damaged, then the entire system, language system is ruined. This is very important for in particular for neurosurgery uh, um, patients, because as you can see here in green, uh, the, uh, this, these are different tumors in three different patients. So, and uh, in this picture, the tumor is just sitting on a tract on, a, on the fat here and doesn't affect it. Here, it shifts the frontal Aslan tract considerably to the motor regions. And here you can see a very huge tumor which shifts all the tracts, but still the tracts are not damaged. So they are shifted, the cortical representations are shifted. So if a neurosurgeon, in this case, if a neurosurgeon uh, damages a tract, then the language is considerably affected. And um, uh, in the same, uh, following the same philosophy for interoperative language mapping and uh, white matter uh, tract mapping, um, we are and uh, the, our colleagues uh, suggesting um, uh, different uh, tasks, linguistic tasks to map these different tracts and to tap into their functions. For example, uh, we see that, as I mentioned already, during the stimulation of the IFOF, we observe semantic paraphasias. During the stimulation of the acute fasciculus, we see phonological paraphasias um, and repetition errors. There's a very different aspects of language. And of course, when you map and you try to tap into the function of the IFOF, uh, repetition might not be the task of your choice. Um, right. So um, I refer you to uh, this uh, very important paper summarizing uh, the hodological approach uh, to language. And this is one of the first papers suggesting this approach. Uh, one uh, specific linguistic and non-linguistic functions are related to specific white matter tracts. And uh, the notion of uh, the um, limits of white matter plasticity uh, is discussed. Um, and um, at the end of my talk, I would like to uh, uh, mention very interesting recent findings uh, by some colleagues of us and um, uh, by us ourselves, uh, which uh, suggest uh, some addition to the uh, hydrological model of language. And you can take it as quite strong uh, uh, version 
uh, for the moment, but I suggest you just think about that. Um, that's about uh, the anatomy, the structure which might drive the function. There is uh, a paper uh, published basically in September, I think this year, uh, in brain communications, uh, where they uh, did transcranial magnetic stimulation in uh, neurosurgical patients with tumors preoperatively. So that was before any kind of resection. And um, with TMS, they found language positive sites and then they overlaid, as we did for our intraoperative um, study, um, they overlaid these positive sites with tactography and their positive sites were sitting exactly on the acute fasciculus, uh, in specifically on the um, anterior uh, part of the lung and the anterior indirect segment and in the Geschman territory. For some reason, in the uh, temporal lobe, um, they were not very specific. So again, as in our study with the frontal Iceland tract, in every individual patient, the uh, anatomy was variable. The anatomy of the acute fasciculus was variable, but it uh, was exactly what uh, drives, it is exactly what drives the cortical representation of language, which was found with TMS. And um, uh, some time ago, uh, our group presented uh, our recent data about the uh, dominance of the acute fasciculus in people with different degree of handedness. So we found uh, lab dominance of the acute fasciculus in 94% of our 50 participants. And we also did um, uh, fMRI localizer in these uh, people with the sentence completion task, and we did um, tractography reconstructions. And uh, there was no association found uh, between the um, left lateralization of the acute fasciculus, which was very strong in the entire cohort, um, and their handedness, nor their functional lateralization for language. As you can see here, the uh, functional, uh, the, the representation of, of language was very, very variable uh, in this cohort but it didn't correlate at all with the strong, with, with the lateralization index of the acute fasciculus. Uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, um, it is uh, not just a coincidence that um, it is approximately the same percentage known uh, in respect of uh, aphasia occurrences. Uh, so, about 95% of population, uh, when uh, a specific person gets a stroke, uh, become aphasic um, if the stroke occurs in the left hemisphere. So for us, it means that fMRI maps we get, even with very exquisite linguistic tasks, are not sensitive to the um, uh, language representation in the brain, and maybe the asymmetry of the um, white matter tract, the, the major language white matter tract, the acute fasciculus, is uh, what can, what is the most informative about uh, individual language representation and lateralization. I would like to th thank um, the audience and uh, my entire lab. Uh, so the work I presented from my lab today uh, was done by uh, many, many of us, that's not only me. And uh, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, our funding. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, Olga. This is a fascinating and so such a comprehensive uh, over. I can't hear you well, Yuri. Um, really, really nice. You can start by asking. Uh, uh, just a second. 
And now? Did you, did you not hear me at all? Yeah, it's better now. Uh -oh. <laughs> now yeah, it's better, but it used to be pretty bad. Maybe you can... Right. Yeah I, yeah, I started by thanking you for a comprehensive and fascinating overview <laughs> of, of different data. That's really great. I'm really, I'm really uh, thankful for this. Uh, maybe I could start with a basic question. Uh, like there was at the time of the original uh, Katani and, and others work um, uh, some 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk about uh, differences between male and female brains in terms of uh, arcuate uh, laterality and uh, cross hemispheric connectivity. Uh, has, I think this was sort of put into uh, this was question scenes. What do you know about that, or is, has there been any any more research? I know that for the studies uh, made with uh, hundreds of participants, uh, did not confirm that. Right. So basically, this was a false uh, false finding. Right. I th okay. Uh, there is a question from uh, from Anna. Anna, please go ahead. Anna Krabas. Um, thank you so much for this um, very interesting overview. I have a couple of questions. Maybe I can ask one first and then another. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> so um, the first question concerns the arcuate of fasciculus data. So usually we talk about arcuate fasciculus as connecting and transferring information from the temporal lobe to the frontal areas, but the data on the, that you showed on focal uh, stimulation of the arcuate fasciculus and uh, its uh, potential involvement in, uh, well, the consequences of like the damage to the arcuate fasciculus for the conduction aphasia suggests that there is not only some like transfer from the temporal lobes to the frontal lobes, but there could be some bidirectional flow of information because in order to repeat a word, for example, for somebody with a conduction aphasia, you have to not only rely on the feed forward mechanisms, but also on the feedback mechanisms, right? You have to keep the target, the sensory target in mind that you're trying to repeat. Um, and um, so try to emulate it, right? So that requires some like uh, feedback processing. So like, I don't know data on that. Is there, do you have anything like, is it like, does uh, the flow only proceed in one direction from temporal to frontal uh, lobe with terminations in the frontal lobe or is it possible for the bi-directional transfer of information? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that, and I guess uh, most of the researchers working in this field believe it, that it's bi-directional. Um, Maybe to be on the safe side because we we cannot tell we cannot be sure, um, or because most of the process processes in the brain are bi bidirectional, multidirectional, mm -hmm. and um, and of course these uh, large uh, pathways include accents going uh, in different in both directions, right? So it can I don't believe that's unidirectional, mm -hmm. but on the other hand. Um, I'm not aware of uh, an intraoperative study um, uh, supporting one view or the other. And I can imagine that it could be very difficult to design one. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, so my second question relates to that. If like, if I can ask it later, if other people yeah, want go to ahead, go ahead. Just and, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, the um, the fasciculi are kind of long, right? And we usually talk about disrupting a function of the fasciculus. Like we know that, for example, simulating the arcuate fasciculus leads to dysarthric articulatory errors. Um, but, and we also don't know much about how uh, deep, uh, uh, direct electric stimulation of the brain works, about how the signal, how far the signal propagates along the, um, the pathway, for example. So like, does it matter then where you disrupt, where you simulate the fasciculus? Does it lead to, do we need more specificity? Do we like, we're still talking about um, a different uh, fasciculi as uh, um, fulfilling some functions, but do, does it also matter along the fasciculus, for example, where you stimulate or what area of the fasciculus you disrupt? Does that lead to different errors? Is there a dissociation along the 
um, the the whole the pathway. Um, is it legitimate to talk about just like one them as serving one function? Maybe if you stimulate closer to the, uh, for example, if you take our our um, arcuate fasciculus and stimulate closer to the frontal areas that will result in um, well, speech errors or articulatory errors. However, if you stimulate it or disrupt it closer to the temporal lobe, that's going to lead to different kinds of errors. Or like if you dissimulate it, it disrupts like the whole uh, right. fasciculus. Right. So this is exactly the view um, of uh, people who really work in the field. Uh, of course, what I overviewed today is great simplification. This is basically similar, similar to how Broken Wernicke described their language model. Of course, every uh, associative white matter tract I mentioned today uh, consists of uh, subcomponents, anatomical subcomponents, connecting different regions within those huge cortical areas. And um, it might, I would even start with asking uh, how these subcomponents of each tract are related to specific subfunction mm -hmm. of the huge function we're discussing. Right. Um, because at different uh, points of the huge associative tract, there could be different components coming yeah. to the surface and ready for stimulation. And we know that. Uh, Acute fasciculus, um, uh, at least the, the contemporary model of the acute fasciculus already incorporates uh, different segments. The ILF, uh, actually, there are different uh, proposals for the subcomponents of ILF, which you know that in our lab, we, for, for long, we considered as a, uh, um, a unitary tract. Now mm -hmm. people um, see. Uh, up to five subcomponents in the ILF only. Mm -hmm. And this uh, about the frontal Aslan tract, we know the proposal by Mark Catani about three branches of it to mm -hmm. the coming to the premotor, SMA and pre-SMA, conducting very different functions, starting from core linguistic uh, okay. and finishing with very, very motor peripheral. Okay, that's great. Since I don't do um, tractography, I was like wondering if people are, have started to dissociate right. uh, different this regions. This is very so. fresh and recent, and this gotcha. is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Right. Any other questions, please? Raise your hand or just speak up uh, if you need more time to make up your, your questions. Uh, I can ask another one uh, about the evolution of the tracts. There has been a lot of discussion of the arcuate fascicle being the most uh, sort of a hallmark of language evolution in a way, right? So it 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 it, stri it, it uh, considerably differs between uh, even our uh, closest uh, ape relatives and, and us. What about the other key tracts that uh, you listed? Uh, what do we know? about the evolution, how, whether they can be seen as correlating with language function in any way, or are they more conservative? Um, yes, this is a, a, a developing enterprise. Uh, the comparison of um, human uh, language related white matter tracks with uh, what our, uh, what uh, primates uh, have. And um, so it is not even clear about the acute fasciculus. Uh, not even to go for other tracts, um, because uh, as in newborns, the um, like what reminds the acute fasciculus in primates is not uh, fully myelinated or is not as myelinated as uh, in us, human adults. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, we're ready to seriously discuss other something other than the acute fasciculus for the moment. People try to do uh, such comparisons, but well, right. I don't well, think that we can work, yeah. reconstruct, we can reconstruct um, the previous state um, of our pathological language model. Right, thank you. Anyone else? 
Mm -hmm. Been quiet. I have to say this was extremely clear and also uh, novel to uh, large parts of the audience, I suspect. Uh, I can see Olga has switched on her camera. Uh, do you have a question? No? No, no, just, no. just switching on. Just well, want to say well. that really uh, can confirm Yuri's words that it was excellent and very clear and very unique. 